You're probably coming to this video because you need to file an extension for your taxes. No problem. I'm going to walk you through how to calculate the numbers for the Form 4868, which is the Federal Extension Voucher. Also, I'm going to show you a few different ways you can actually extend your tax return because there is more than one way. My name is Mike the CPA and welcome to Money and Life TV where we make videos around finances, investing, and taxes. You can follow our weekly videos simply by hitting the red subscribe button down below. It would also mean a lot to me if you drop a like on this video to help this information reach more people. Thank you so much. This is Form 4868, the application for automatic extension of time to file your U.S. individual income tax return. And this video specifically deals with United States tax law. Although an extension grants you additional time to file your taxes, it does not grant you additional time to pay your taxes. So don't be confused with that. That's why we have to try to calculate or estimate to the best of our ability what we think we might owe by the initial filing deadline, which for 2020 is May 17th. Normally, the traditional deadline has always been April 15th. If for whatever reason you cannot pay your taxes or whatever balance you owe at this point, then it will accrue interest and penalties at a rate of about a half percent per month on the unpaid balance due. The good news is when you file a federal extension voucher, you automatically extend the time you have to file your state tax return as well. Now in this video, I'm only showing you a federal extension payment voucher. If for whatever reason you think you're gonna owe for the state in which you live, I would also suggest making a separate state extension payment as well you might have a federal extension payment due, and you might also have a state extension payment due. So you have to look at both. Okay, now let's walk through this form and I'll show you how they, I got these numbers and what these lines actually mean when you're looking at this. Regardless of your filing status, whether you're single, married filing jointly, or married filing separately, the process to file your extension is pretty much exactly the same. In the example we're looking at, this is a single individual and they just have money from wages, they have a little bit of investment income, a little bit of self-employment income, and that's pretty much it. This taxpayer has a taxable income of $41,874 after their standard deduction and whatever other adjustments apply. Therefore, on page two of the 1040, on line 16, you'll see a tax of 4,954, but that's not their total tax liability. They also had self-employment taxes, so they had to add some additional tax on line 23. Therefore, their total tax, their total tax liability based on their income and their various types of income is $5,661. Now, what you'll notice is that is the amount on the extension voucher on line four. So when it talks about your, your estimated tax liability or estimate of total tax liability for 2020 or whatever year you're in and looking at this that is the line it's referring to it's not your tax liability is not the amount you end up owing down here that's what you that's the portion of your tax liability that's unpaid but your actual tax liability is this right here is the total tax line, which is line 24 on page two of your 1040. So that's where that number goes. The next line we're looking at is line five of this extension voucher, which is total 2020 payments. And when they say payments, this could be payments from withholdings, it could be estimated tax payments, it could be that maybe you had a refund last year and applied it towards this current year's taxes. So those are the three possible types of payments. In this example though, the person, the taxpayer just had wages. So the only payments they made were from withholdings of $3,000. If they had other payments in here, they would also include that as well, but they don't in this example. So just $3,000 of withholdings is the actual payment amount, which is why we put $3,000 right here. So just look at your return that way and see what you've paid in throughout the year. Most people just have W-2 withholdings. If you have a business, you might have some W-2 withholdings and also estimates. So just look at what you've paid in and put that total payment amount from all those sources of payments on line five. The last thing it wants on line six is the balance due. Now this is the unpaid portion of your tax liability of $5,661 in this example. And if you fill out most of your return, this is pretty straightforward because you have these numbers available. But I'm gonna talk to you 
about what if you haven't even started your return yet. I'll talk to you about that in just a second. But you can see the on, the amount you owe based on this tax filing at the moment on what information is in here. And this example is $2,661, which is what goes on line six. So you can see how this form really does relate back to the actual 1040 as we're picking up the certain line items one by one and placing it here. So it has a logical flow when you look at both sides of it. It matches the 1040 as it is right now. Line seven now, it says the amount you are paying is line seven. Now this is where you have your discretion. You can choose to pay the exact amount. So you could pay this amount exactly, but you have to use some judgment here. You might have other forms of income that you have not reported yet on your actual tax return here. Maybe you haven't gotten a form yet. Maybe you're waiting for, for a K-1 statement or maybe, maybe you're waiting for an investment state, statement or some things to be finalized and straightened out. So if you think you're gonna have more money coming, I mean, uh, more income coming in, which is gonna be taxable, then you, ha you might wanna up this. Now, what I generally recommend to clients is I usually just round up, is what I do. If you can pay it, because it's better, to my opinion, it's better to be a little overpaid than underpaid, because if you start to be underpaid, you're gonna have to start paying interest and penalties on whatever balance that is coming due. For most people, it's probably not that much, if anything. Um, if you have a refund, you have if you have a refund after this is all said and done, well then you can just have the money returned to you, or you can apply this re the refund to next year's estimates. But I would, re me personally, you can do what you want to do, but I usually try to pay in a little bit more, especially if I think I have other forms of income that I still need to report on my tax return. So it is totally up to your discretion. Now, if you think you have a refund coming in, then you can just file this extension voucher without paying anything, and that's totally fine. You now, if you have a balance due, like the example we were just looking at, you can still choose to pay zero. It's gonna cost you some interest and penalties until you pay it, but you can choose to not pay anything at all. Now, what do you do if you have not even begun your return? Well, what I advise people to do is look at your historical tax returns. Look at the last two years worth of tax returns and see where you came out. Did you end up getting a refund down here or did you end up owing last year? If your income it has been consistent, you're making about the same amount, then likely the, your, your tax situation is gonna follow that. It's all a calculation based on your income and whatever dedu normal deductions you have and, and whatever you pay in throughout the year through withholdings, estimates, and so on and so forth. So I would look at your historical data if you normally get a refund, then I would probably not even pay anything with the extension if you normally get a refund and if your income is fairly consistent with prior years. If you normally owe in prior, if you saw you owe in like 18 and 19, for example, if you're looking back at those tax years, then you're probably gonna owe again for 2020 unless you change your withholdings to be higher or unless you made less income. So you're probably gonna owe something though. So if you, let's say you normally owe 1,000 or $2,000 every time you file your taxes. Well, if that is the case, then I would probably pay in $2,000 with the extension. And now I know it's just an estimate. I know that you know that's not the exact number, but it's better than nothing. It's better than not paying anything at all and having to pay interest and penalties on top of whatever you may owe. So you can also use your effective tax rate or your marginal tax rate to guide you. Marginal tax rate just follows the federal income tax brackets. So whether you're in the 0%, 12%, 22%, 24%, 28%, you can follow that logic and those brackets to help guide you. Because maybe your wages is similar, right? So you've made 60,000 in wages in 18, 19, maybe you've made 64,000 in wages in 2020. I don't know, I'm just throwing out some numbers. But that would be pretty similar income. But then you say, well, wait, Mike, wait, wait, wait. I also made an additional $20,000 from my sale of investments. What do I do with that? Well, with that, you can just estimate a dollar figure on that to add to your extension payment. So if everything else is the same, but you happen to make another ten or $20,000 in income, well, then multiply that additional ten or $20,000 in income by your marginal tax rate to determine a payment. So if you made an additional $10,000 and you're in the marginal tax bracket of 22%, take 22% of 10,000 and add that to your extension payment. So that's how you can estimate those numbers pretty quickly. But nonetheless, I think for you, honestly, the best practice is, is try to calculate and estimate what you think you might owe by the initial due date of the tax return and pay in an amount with your extension. 
the, just the very act of paying in and amount with your extension is gonna automatically extend your time to file. The last part of this I wanna cover with you in terms of this voucher is make sure your information on part one is correct. Double check your spelling, double check your social security number. If you're, if you're married, make sure your spouse's social security number is entered here just to make sure everything's filled out correctly because they're gonna have to use this to match your payment up with your tax return and if this information is wrong they might make a mistake and your payment might not be applied as you wanted it to be double check everything in general so now let me show you where you go to figure out where to mail this when you go to the irs website irs.gov and search form 4868 or just google form 4868 and go to the one that has the link to the irs website when you open this up and this is where you can find this pdf as well i'll leave links to this in the comment and description section so you guys can find this this is, if you want to pause the screen, you can read it here, but this is where you would actually file a paper form 4868. And you can see based on what state you live in, where to mail it right from this screen. So if you, you can pause the video here if you want, and just so you know where to mail this. Attach the voucher, attach your check, and mail it to wherever it specifies here. Now, if you're like me, I really don't like filling out vouchers, mailing in payments and all of that. I'm really not into that at all. I would much rather prefer to pay it online, which I'm gonna show you how to do next. The reason I walked you through that form 4868 is to give you the detail, give you some more background, some more explanation, so it would actually makes sense to you of what you're doing and where those numbers are coming from. But now that you have a better understanding of how to quickly calculate an extension payment or at least estimate what the number could be and give you a few different tools and approaches to work with. Now I'm going to show you where to go to do that online. Bottom line is, is just pay your extension or file your extension in whatever way you're most comfortable with. If you want to pay it on a voucher with a check, fine. That's totally fine. Now let's just look at it here on their IRS website. So we go to irs.gov website and right here it says file an extension. So we're going to go here. We're going to click file an extension extension of time to file your tax return. You can read all this, I'm not gonna read it to you, but just go down to see where it says direct pay. That's what I would recommend, go to direct pay. Click on that. And basically what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to enter your checking account information. It's a one-time thing and they're gonna directly deduct the money from your checking account and that's how the payment will be made. And by doing it that way, there's no fees, there's no penalties. There's a couple other ways to make payments, I believe, but this is the way where you can do it where there's no additional fees and the way I recommend. So click on make payment now, make payment, and then it says reason for payment. So all you do is start here. You wanna select extension, apply payment to 4868, right? So it automatically knows that we're doing an extension. And then tax period payment is 2020, of course, because that's the current tax year when I'm producing this video. Click continue. It says you have chosen to make an extension payment, blah, 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 for tax year 2020. Is this correct? Yes. And then through here, you're going to enter your tax ID information, which is basically your, or your, I mean, sorry, tax year for identification. You're going to enter your filing status. You're going to enter your social security number, date of birth for you and your spouse, or just you if you're filing single or another filing status and just click continue and you can start walking through the steps. And lastly, it's gonna ask you for your checking account information, you're gonna drop that in, you're gonna say how much you wanna pay, you're gonna put that dollar figure in, and you're good. Now you can also, usually most state websites, you can pay extension vouchers as well. So I'll go to like the friend for me, I'll, if I, because I live in California, if I wanna make my, my state uh, extension payment, I will go to the Franchise Tax Board website on the ftbcalifornia.gov, and I'll click pay. I'm just showing you an example. You know, I would go through my bank account and use web personal pay and so on and so forth. But through here, I can indicate eventually that the reason for payment is an extension. Therefore, you can make your payments through a voucher. You can make them online typically for most state websites as far as I'm aware of. So there's, there's like two primary ways to do this. And then once you pay it, you're done. Just make sure all this is done by the due date or before. I usually recommend before. Just it's better safe than sorry. And that's the way to go about this. All right, that is all the information I have for you. Hopefully this helped clarify some things. And now you can move forward and file your extension with a little bit more confidence and understanding of what you're actually doing. If you liked today's video, please do me a huge favor and drop a like. Leave comments below. I love to hear what you have to say, questions, comments, whatever it may be. The best part about doing YouTube is actually interacting with you. Subscribe for our future weekly videos around finances, investing, and taxes. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Live life uncaged, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.